and welcome to Opwell's Field Notes, a podcast created by Operation Wallacea to share stories and insights from our 25 years working in the field. My name is Sophia Wood, Opwell's Country Manager for Ecuador and Director of Friends of Wallacea, and I will be your host for this series. We launched this podcast to shine a light on the world of biodiversity field research and the work of those who dedicate their lives to understanding and protecting our planet. Each month, we have conversations with scientists, community conservationists, and experienced academics about new research, protecting biodiversity, and daily life out in the field. Today, I am joined by Dr. Raquel Thomas, the Director of Resource Management and Training at the Iwakrama International Center for Rainforest Conservation and Development. Raquel got her PhD in tropical forest ecology at Imperial College London, where she studied the role of rodents in seed dispersal in neotropical forests. Raquel has always had a passion for forests and tree composition, which led her to continue research on the diverse plant communities of the Guyana Shield region. You'll hear her express this passion, including showing me an amazing rainforest seed that she keeps on her desk throughout this episode. Raquel was quickly asked to become the Director of Resource Management and Training at Iwakrama in 2005 and has led the organization ever since, ensuring that the forest remains protected while also providing income for local communities. Join us in this episode to learn about how sustainable forest management works, why conservation is so much more than just science, and how business can partner with Indigenous communities to protect biodiversity. Hi Raquel, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Sophie. Nice to meet you. And thanks for having me. So since we're taping everything from home, where are you based right now? Well, I am most days based at home because of COVID. I've been working from home, but we actually recently shifted office, a new location. I try to come into office at least once or twice a week. Also, I have a volunteer who started with me yesterday, so I have to supervise him a bit. (laughs) And your office is in Georgetown, Guyana. It's in Georgetown. Of course, the main hub of Iwakrama is in the interior, which is about eight hours drive or one hour flight away. Perfect. So as we get started, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to become a scientist and start working in conservation? Well, I think since I was very young, I mean, except for when I was really, really young, I wanted to be an air hostess, you know, and in my day when you're young, being an air hostess was just the amazing thing. You get to travel the world and so on. But later on, I did want to get into medicine and I actually started a biology degree at the University of Guyana and then I changed I switched I wanted to do microbiology at some point um when I finished my first degree at UG the bio degree I actually was trying to get a job I couldn't get the job in that field and I actually was employed at the University of Guyana for for three years in the public relations unit where first as a research assistant and then afterwards it progressed to, um, I actually got a, what do you call a, you know, a promotion to being, a, what was it, assistant, assistant PRO or public relations officer. But what happened then is I almost switched a career in communication, but I found that I was missing science and an opportunity came up to do this PhD in, you know, studying agoutis and looking at sea dispersal and so on. And I actually applied for it. I was really interested in it. And it involved me having to go and live in the center of Guyana within a logging concession where I had to do this research. Um, It was competitive. Luckily, they they accepted me. And voila, here I am, the best career I could ever. Well, I didn't even choose. It chose me, right? So I'm really now what is called a tropical forest ecologist. But in my heart, always a biologist. (laughs) That's a great story. So yes. what was the research question behind your PhD? Also, the PhD was really looking at how agoutis actually used food, or we call it resource use, across different forest types. In Guyana or in the hemisphere, maybe any forest, it's not, a homo- it's not homogenous. The forest is made up of several forest types. So what I looked at is fruiting patterns and flowering patterns, what I call phenology, across four different forest types to see what was happening. Um, And then try to relate it to how agoutis would bury these seeds. Because what happens with agoutis, they behave like squirrels. They actually bury seeds and what is called scatter hoarding, and then they go back to to, to retrieve them. And that's where they, they actually are seed predators. 
But in many cases, they don't return to 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 actually get back those seeds, and then mm -hmm. they, they can germinate and establish. Mm -hmm. So in that way, the agoutis are actually one of the most important seed dispersal agents for large seeded species in the Guyanas. One exciting thing about my research, and this research was done since 1995, from 1995 to 1999, that was the period for my work. Um, and I actually was linked to Imperial College in the UK as well. But an interesting thing that happened between my research, I had two extreme years. I had an extreme La Nina, where you have rain falling into the rainy season. And then I had an extreme El Nino where uh, 1997, 98, he had one of the worst El Ninos in a hundred years, where many countries experience droughts. I think Peru usually gets flooding, but places like Indonesia and even Guyana, we actually experience like fires and, and so on. So what I was able to, to really assess is how these extreme weather conditions could impact fruiting patterns. And what happened incidentally, after the La Nina, when we had a lot of rain, we had massed flowering and fruiting across the forest types. Now what that means is really that all the species within like a family flowered and fruited. So we had a huge amount of fruits that occurred that year. The next year you had this horrible drought. So what happened was that a lot of flowers aborted, the fruits, you know, aborted and so on as well. And you had much less food available for agoutis to bury. So what I really indicates is that how a forest would regenerate really depends on the cycles of phenology, how much is fruiting and so on. So that will depend on if the agouti needs to use, uh, use the fruit as a predator or they bury them and then, you know, those can recruit. So what we would assume is that in the bad El Nino year, the forest didn't really recruit very well because the agoutis needed to use all that food. So I was lucky wow. in a sense. That's, that's <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So for people who've not gone to the rainforest before, and agoutis, uh, a big rodent, it's right? It's a big rodent. is one of the largest rodents. It's the capybara is the largest. Then they have the, um, the lava or the paca. Then you have the agouti. But the agouti is the one who does this scatter hoarding pattern and behavior. And they're very, very smart animals. Because I got an opportunity to actually study them and like do focals and uh, um, observe how they do see this person and so on. Wow, that's really, that's really cool. Um, so how did you first get become involved in the management of the Iwakrama Center for Rainforest Conservation and Development? And could you maybe tell us a bit more about the project at Iwakrama? Yeah, so maybe first I'll give you a little explanation about what Iwakrama is. Iwakrama is actually a forest in the area. It's one million acres. And we manage just one million acres. It's one of five protected areas in Guyana. But it's a protected area that was differently organized. In like about 31 years ago, the then president invited the Commonwealth to actually partner with the government of Guyana to manage this area, this 1 million acres, but mainly to do research and development activities as relates to how you can use a forest without losing it. So the area is divided into two areas, a wilderness preserve, which we can never touch, but that acts like a control site. And we also have a sustainable use area where we can do sustainable use activities. So such as tourism, forestry, and some other activities as well. The area also is bordered by rivers mostly, and these are public access. And there's a public road that runs through it. So you can drive from Georgetown, go through Iwakrama, head to the border, get into Brazil, and get to the rest of South America um, from driving, which is public access. So it was purposely selected for that because it was known that we will be doing these sustainable use activities. So it's a very unique project and it has some very interesting partnerships. So we have co-management agreements with, for example, the 20 indigenous communities that we work with. We work through a body known as the North Rupununi District Development Board. We work with many universities, as you know, OPWAL, we partner with Operation Wallacea, we partner with donors, we do a lot of project um, related activities. We do business. Um, the business really of forestry and tourism really is that we have the saying where we say con um, conservation without money is just a conversation. We have to pay for it. So we have multiple ways of trying to raise funds. So we have the business. Also, that biz the businesses also test models of forest use of which you can do research 
linked to that. So we have research activities. We have we work with indigenous communities. We 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 of course we have the forestry and the tourism businesses. So it's really a space where a multitude of activities go on. How I got involved in Iwakrama though, it's when I first came back from doing my PhD, I was in the UK for a few years after I did my research in Guyana um, in a place called Mogura. I was actually, uh, I applied or was invited actually to participate in a program known as a professional development program at Iwakrama. Uh, the contract was for two years and you work with a special advisor and I worked there from 19, what was it, 1999 to 2001. And the idea was that you work in a mentorship position and then you would go out and kind of contribute to Guyana. So after that, in 2001, I was employed, I applied to the Guyana Forestry Commission, which is a government agency that manages the forest estate in Guyana. And I worked there for four years. Um, I had a fantastic time there, but somehow Iwakrama always caught my heart. <laughs> So in 19, what was it? Sorry, 2005, a position came up, the position, the director for resource management and training. And I was invited to apply. And I, I, I went back in 2005 and I've been there since then. Um, I do love Iwakrama. So I'm happy to be there and I'm continuing to work there and partner with wonderful people like you and Opwal and, and all these really amazing people that we work with. Well, that's a that's a great story, and I was I was going to ask you a little bit about the the work with Opwal, but first, kind of, what does your role as the director of resource management entail and training? So, um, I actually am overall in charge of the um, monitoring of the Wakrama Forest. When you manage a protected area, you have to have a management plan. And part of that management is that you have to do monitoring. So remember I told you have a public access road and then the rivers are public access. So we have to look for illegal activities. That's one aspect. But remember, we are also doing businesses. So we have to look at our impacts on the forest. You have to monitor that as well. But not only the impacts on the environment or the, the forest environment, we also have to look at the impacts we're having on people. So the communities that we work with in particular there's one community that's within the protected area known as Fairview. So we, we really pay really close attention to how we're impacting that, that particular community. One thing I want to mention is that when we're talking about natural resource management or conservation, um, the whole thing about sustainable natural resource use has three pillars. So you have to look, yes, at the environmental or the ecological aspects. But you also have to look at the people aspects or what they call the social aspects. And also key is the financial aspects. How are you going to support this conservation? So Iwakram is premised on this. And even with our forestry, we are FSC certified as well um, because we are there to show that it can be done and we are a model. And so we can share our experiences with the world. Well, that was so well summed up those three pillars. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily have it clear that biology yeah. and the monitoring is only part of it. And actually the communities and the financial aspect is a huge part of making conservation successful long term. Absolutely. Um, so how then did your work um, at Iwakrama lead you to connecting with with Opwal? Well, the great thing about my job is I also am in charge of training at Teokrama or what we call learning services. So um, I get to deal with volunteers, students, university groups, and so on. So that's how I connected with Operation Wallacea. With, um, in 2011, I was introduced to Dr. Tim Coles, and he ind indicated that he wanted to, he was looking at bringing us, uh, having Guyana as a site. And of course, he was interested in Iwakrama being at least one of the sites here. So in 2011, we actually were able to start that. Um, we partner with Iwakrama and the community, one of the communities associated to Iwakrama, that's Sarama, where the students come. And the thing is, Opal is always of a purpose. So the purpose really of partnering with us was to contribute to actually our monitoring system, where we devise a methodology where we can collect long-term data to help us monitor Iwakrama. So it helps us to fill gaps. So remember I told, told you that Iwakrama is divided into a sustainable use area as well as a wilderness preserve. So some of the sites 
are on wilder are on the wilder in the wilderness preserve and some in the sustainable utilization area and then we could see what's going on in sarama sarama village as well so offwall is providing this long-term data set with which we can actually get information about what we do and one of the areas that offwall has is set up is within our logging area and that that information has been really helpful for us with our fsc audits um, assessments when they come. So we are able to look at what's happening over, over time. And as uh, I don't know if people are aware that with Opwal, we do a lot of faunal monitoring and some of the indicator species would be birds and bats. So those are two of the areas that we look at. We do large mammals, um, some amount of dung beetle. Um, we check on dung beetles as well. Dung, dung beetles, people are like, why are you dealing with dung beetles? But dung beetles actually as a bioindicator um, species, it actually helps to give you an indication of the, the health of your environment. So the more dung you see, and you can tell what kind of dung it is, and the beetles are there, and the more beetles you see actually, will actually tell you that you have animals within this forest. So it actually, it, it becomes sort of like a bioindication of what you have, even if you may not see the animals. And now you can support that by having camera traps. <laughs> That's such a great point. It's kind of like ticks. You can't really have them without mammals. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So I never thought of that. That's really interesting. Um, Incidentally, so, oh, um, one thing, Sophia, ma mammal dispersal is represents, and from the work I did looking at dispersal with agoutis, represents in the Guyanas, at least for Guyana, and the species that I collected over 70%, about seven to 1% of the species are mammal dispersed in terms of plant species from what I found. Wow, so you really can't have a forest without mammals. No, nor, nor can you have a forest without plants. My love is plants. <laughs> as much as I of love course. me, I am really into the plants. And there's a project that really got, that, got me into that. As you can see, I was showing well, you earlier, this is the yes. seed from the I guess forest. people people who are listening from home can't see the seed, but oh, yeah. Raquel has a, a huge seed about the size of her palm that yeah. is apparently a favorite of Agutis and it's sitting Agutis. right on her desk. And a favorite of humans too. <laughs> it's very tasty. It's called sorry nut, uh, Caria carno no, nociferum is the scientific name. Really interesting. Some of the <laughs> things that, that you know gets me um, going in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so over the last 15 years managing this forest, what are some of your proudest achievements and most exciting things you've learned? You know, I love the forest. I love the rainforest and I love the savannas. You might have heard of the Rupanoni savannas from Operation Wallacea, but my, my thing is it's, it, it has to come back to people and the people that I work with. Um, capacity building for me is the proudest thing that we, we can say Iwakrama has done. So national capacity building as well as capacity building within the communities. And capacity building is not a one-way process, it's a two-way process. I have learned a lot from, um, from people over the years, especially the indigenous people that we work with. And you have, we value, we value scientific knowledge as well as traditional knowledge so for me it's it's about people and we do have the concept that you cannot really have conservation if you don't care about the people so it's about people managing people who are managing the environment when you take care of the people my view is is that people will take care of the environment automatically so you'll save the tapirs you save the jaguars and so on because people's needs are being met if you, if you can understand. People, you have to meet people's needs in a sense, and then they will care. And that's what I love about yeah, Ewa Kram and the fact that the communities that we work with are so conservation-minded. You know, even though they use the resources, they are very um, caring about how they do and how they use it. So you've talked a lot about supporting local communities, ensuring that they have you know, access to the financial resources that they need to meet their needs. So how can these businesses that you've been creating support conservation projects in indigenous communities? And as a follow on, are there business models that you've seen that have been particularly successful or on the other hand, some that you've tried and just 
haven't worked? Well, you know, the interesting about business is that you, I don't know if you ever heard it, only 15% of businesses actually succeed. So it will cram as a place to look for models. And of course, we've had many failures in terms of some of the businesses that we've tried. I mean, in all the businesses, what we try to do is like you create capacity building. So for instance, there was one called Aquarium Fish Project. And while it could have been quite successful, I think what happened, it was they became too dependent on the middleman um, to actually uh, execute and get, you know, actually he would do the one to export the fish and so on. So that one came to a little bit, it started well and then it collapsed after a while. So it, it didn't really last long term. We also had another project called the Butterfly Project where we were looking to, we created this big kind of greenhouse and we were rearing butterflies and then we were, we were exporting them to butterfly houses in the UK. The challenge with that project, why it ended up not being as successful as we would have liked it, is that we, we had to deal with agricultural pests, eating all the plants of the land that the caterpillars were supposed to eat. And then you only, excuse me, we only had a very small window to get the larvae to the, to the UK. And then the road was bad, really, really bad one that um, for the two years. So sometimes we couldn't get the larvae on time to England. And if you don't make it, make it within that space, you'd have butterflies emerging while en route. To, so those kind of project, those kind of projects were, were quite, quite challenging, but we've had many successes. And what we found, and I think this is a message for anybody who's doing project management, is that when you're developing a project, you need to sit down with the communities and consult with them. Find out if, find out their needs first and see if you can create a project around their needs, because those are the projects that are most successful. If you are introducing a new idea, which they're really receptive to as well, ensure that they participate in designing and developing it. Um, so like for instance, the Butterfly Project, it had, a, it had a, a indigenous component and so on because we also had to do research um, around it, even though it didn't end up being as successful as we hoped. But we got like a farming manual out of it. We got a butterfly manual out of it. So there are things that are very tangible that we got out of it. But what I think has been the most successful um currently is the tourism so the, the 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 work in tourism that we've been doing over the years what we have now seen is that communities saw that it can work and they started applying it to their communities so you have sarama you have rewa you have yupakari and then the, the Guyana Tourism Authority now is working with another set of communities to start developing their products around other parts of Guyana. So like region one, you have a, 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 a village called Warapoka, which we were fortunate to visit last year because Iwakrama, we had a consultancy. We have a consultancy to do a project anyway. So we wanted to develop that. The community within Iwakrama, they're interested in developing tourism, Fairview, Fair, Fairview Village as well, and so are some other communities, but not everybody. Not everybody's interested in tourism. Some communities might be more interested in developing products that can supply the lodges that are doing tourism. Because if everybody's doing tourism, it probably you probably won't have every community may not may not benefit equal, uh, as equitably, not equally, equitably. So it's good to see like a diversification of the kinds of things you do. So producing. Um, uh, art, artist products. They're very like Ruperti, for example, does very good craft with wood products. There are some communities that do good Tibisiri work, even on the coast, like Santa Mission and um, what's the other, St. Cuthbert's Mission and so on. And uh, there's Nappy Village that really works with this, um, what we call Manel Cara, Vidantata, or Bullet Wood, Balata is like a, a rubber, which was used as a substitute for rubber actually during the First World War. It was our first forest product from Guyana. So they do these beautiful little figurines. I'm sorry, I don't have any to show you. Um, and that's really something that they really have been making and making making money off of. So I think it's not that we stick to one thing, but we can we can do a, like multi, multi products and then support these other businesses. So tourists have something when they leave, they can leave with a small product that say, okay, I was in Guyana here and this product that I bought is supporting this community or the women of this community or, or something like that. In terms of our forestry, a lot of the persons we've trained are from the villages and communities. 
and they're taking back those um, lessons and those methodologies into their communities. So using those very sustainable approaches to actually, because, you know, all these communities also have, they do do resource use, they do take timber and so on. So we're hoping that like being trained at Ewokrama in the best use practices that I would actually filter in to the communities when they're, some of them are even looking to do their own little businesses as well. So those kinds of examples, I think are important. Well, I, I would say, I think you learn as much or more from businesses and the projects that failed um, as Absolutely. from projects that succeeded. So it's worth sharing those stories as well it is with people who sharing. are trying to do it the same way. I don't know. We have grown up in a culture that we are afraid of failure. I don't know why. I failed physics, I proudly say, when I first wrote it at GC level, as that's the British, um, was the British system kind of then. And you know what? I'm glad I failed it because the first time I wrote it, I really struggled with it. I wrote it back. And then I actually remember, um, understood a lot more of the concepts. I don't know why I failed physics because I was brilliant in math. <laughs> so it was really strange. But anyway, but the lesson there is that we should not be afraid of failure because we have to keep trying if you're really interested in businesses. One of the things that I, I have found is that when you work in communities and you want to speak to business development, you have to find also the entrepreneurial persons in communities. It's like any other part of the world. Don't, I don't think we should treat indigenous communities any differently. If you look in the cities, there are only a certain amount of people that want to be businessmen, those are the, or businesswomen, those are the risk takers and so on. Many people don't want to do that. Some people just want to be an academic. Some people want to be a priest. Some people want to be, you know, in a, in, in a convent. Some people want to just, you know, do different things. Somebody wants, some people want to be writers. You right, know, or journalists. artists or jam artists. makers. Artists, <laughs> artists, you know, so important that we have artists and musicians, you know, and then they have people to manage them, the business part of it, because some of them are not, while that's, some of them are really good, many of them are not good. In, right. But they need I think that's a great point. Yes. That not everybody is going to be the entrepreneur and not every community is going to want to absolutely be entrepreneurial or host tourists or whatever. It takes work of going into each one and discussing how they want to go forward. Absolutely. So taking away from this project, what do you wish other countries or other conservation projects would learn from Iwakrama or from Guyana as an example of how to engage indigenous communities in conservation and development? Well, one of the things I would like people to learn is that partnerships work. On the highest level of Iwakrama, this is a partnership between the government of Guyana and the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth is many countries within the Commonwealth. So we want to show that that is possible. And then on the partnership level, partnerships, like for instance, we have a co-management agreement with the 20 communities that we work with. Um, and that, and we, we have partnerships with universities, as, we, as I mentioned before, businesses, donors, and so on. And that we really, no man is an island. We cannot do it alone. And conservation has to operate like that. We have to collaborate. Collaboration to conserve is very important. The second thing I want people to learn is that we're talking here about conservation, not preservation. And our concept of conservation involves use. So we do cut a few trees, we do, you know, you know, we do use some aspects of the forest because you have to have that social link, socioeconomic link where people matter. People, once their needs are taken care of, they will take care of the environment, right? And if we can show lessons that, think that, that certain resource use can be done in a good way, that is what we would like to share with the world as well. So that whole concept of, um, you know, that conservation must involve some, in our sense, can involve some, some, some sustainable use activities. The third, which I probably should have said first, and it's linked to partnerships, is that people matter. I think it's linked to both of the People matter, and you have to put people first. For me, it's about conservation works if you actually put, and, and, and many people don't really sell it like this. They usually sell that nature doesn't need us. I know it's probably conflicting with 
with one organization right now that nature doesn't need us. We need nature. Yes, I understand that concept. But if we focus, if we do focus on people and, and, and capacity building and nurturing people um, in terms of the environment and teaching about it in a good way, I think we can actually convert actually a lot of persons in terms of caring, but understanding that, that this wonderful rainforest we have in Guyana, eight to 7% of it, um, it's, it's amazing, but it also can be used in a good way, right? And of course, with protected areas, you have to have some parts put aside where we can never touch because you have to leave that there for genetic, for, for, for biodiversity maintenance, for genetic diversity, you might have a, a special population you need to protect. Like for instance, in Guyana, we have the red siskin, which is a very rare bird and it's only located in one area. So you have to completely protect that area. I can't say, oh, we're gonna do sustainable harvesting of the red siskin, no. So it's not, I'm not talking about impractical conservation, I'm talking about very practical conservation. So I think those are the three things, the main things I would like people to know. And I would like people to know that they can be part of it. You know, they can be part of it. They can, they can contribute to conservation efforts. They can volunteer. They can come like an op wall. So when you come on an op wall experience as a student, you not only, it not only helps you, you're actually learning about scientific techniques and so on, but you get to interact with different cultures. You get to come and see how conservation works elsewhere, whether it's Guyana, Mexico, Belize, Indonesia, wherever you go. And you get to, I, I think it really, for scientists, an awful experience can really define whether you still want to be a scientist or not. <laughs> it is a self-selecting process. Right? Yes, it, it is. is. It well, is. So. I was, I was going to say, you know, obviously Guyana is a global example of how putting people first has worked. As you said, 87% yes. of the rainforest in Guyana is pretty much intact. Um, yes. Even it's obviously a small country and a small population, but that being said, the people are well taken care of and that is why the forest stays that way and not vice versa. Yeah, but I, I do think, I'm not saying that we don't have challenges because one of the challenges we have right now at Iwakrama is illegal mining. And we were kind of getting it under control in 2019 and then in 2020, COVID. And what happened with COVID, our tourism crashed. We had to send people home. We had to send home some of our rangers. We had to send home a number of staff. So we weren't able to, to actually go in to monitor as often. And the people knew that, that, okay, these people are not coming. We are going to go in. And while they were doing just small damage before, they started creating horrific damage within the Okrama Forest. But I'm really grateful we've gotten... Um, always assistance from the government of Guyana, the police force who we partner with and so on. So we're actually working on curbing that. But I must say this past 2020 really has helped to exacerbate the problem. We also had some illegal trafficking of persons going through Iwakrama. Remember the Brazil border was closed and people wanted to come in from Brazil. So unfortunately, we had some situations with that we had to deal with illegal alcohol, even some illegal, you know, it, it's just like people lost jobs and lost income. That, that's the bottom line. And one of the first things you can go and do to make money is go and mine, do go mining. So what you had people, people who may not have even thought about it before, suddenly were going into areas and doing illegal mining and some other illegal activities. So COVID, while it has offered great opportunities, and yes, I know we speak a lot about resilience and so on, it also has had and continues to have a huge impact on many household incomes. So it's something that we have to think about. Um, you know, when, I, when we do, when we go, we talk about we going after illegal miners. And so I do have tried to chat with some of them and see, you know, try to understand why they're there, you know, what's going on and so on. We don't really use that hearts in the beginning. You don't use that like hard stick approach. You go with a nice approach and then Later on, the police and the Guyana geology and mines will have to come in if they persist. You know, many of them listen, but some of them are very persistent. So um, it's just how, you know, it's really interesting. And, and it has given me a different perspective because I understand forestry very well. 
But mining is a whole other kind of culture that I'm now trying to, to learn about. And then we have oil. We Guyana discovered oil offshore, and that is bringing a whole other dimension to how we are viewed as a country that is dealing with conservation. Because now you're, you're dealing with oil. We have 8 to 7% forest, but then what are we considered now? Because we are oil producing nation. So that's another interesting thing that we're dealing with. Well, you guessed my next question actually and already answered it, which was uh, which was about what the implications had been in, in all the gap in data and projects and tourism that has happened in the last year. So I'll, I'll skip past that. It sounds like yes. we've, already, we've already answered that and move forward to ask you what your favorite part of working in the field is and maybe some of the biggest challenges that you've come across. Um, my favorite, I love the rainforest. When I go into the forest, you know, it's like my, I, I tell people that's my medicine. The forest is my medicine. It, it's, it's a healing space. And I think until you, if you, you have had, well, you would have had, but for many people, I always tell people they need to, even if they're in an apartment, if they're in the city, you do need to go back to nature at some point to help ground you, which would include, even if you have a little lawn in front of your house, going and walking barefoot, just grounding yourself with nature is very important. So, so for me, just going in the field and being able to do that and seeing the savannas and the mountains in the Rupununi is a very special place for me as well. But for me, the best part of my job always comes back to the people I work with. It comes back to the people because unless you have that environment where you can work with, with amazing people, you'll never, you, you know, you can work in an area that is beautiful, but if you don't have the supportive staff, the kind of people that you want to be around every day, it really, it really doesn't make sense. So for me, fundamentally, it goes back to the people that I work with. And I am actually very privileged um, to be able to work with them and also some of the partners that we engage with as well, that they, they see Awokrama as a place that they can, can continue to support, including the government, the community partners that we work with is very special, even donors, some of the businesses we engage. So I just want to say I'm really grateful for all of it. But fundamentally, I'm really grateful for the people that I work day to day with on the ground. Well, that's a, always a beautiful sentiment. I think <laughs> it, it, it yeah. makes a difference no matter what industry you're in and no matter Absolutely. where you work. Absolutely. And Absolutely. So what is the craziest or coolest thing you've seen while working in the field? There are a few crazy things. Um, we have a, a Kaiman named Sankar at Krama. Every time I see him, I feel as a little, that's really cool and really cool. I'll tell you one experience that I had in the forest um, was one a monitoring trip that we went on in, I think it was around 2005. And in between three o'clock and eight o'clock, we saw so many wildlife. I know it will never happen to me again. We saw a tapir. We saw a giant anteater. We saw a jaguar. We saw a rainbow boa. We saw an anaconda that had just eaten um, something we think was a bush hog. We saw two turtles all between 3 p.m. and 8 a.m. that night. It has never That's happened amazing. again. It has never happened again. It was myself and two rangers, and we had an intern and a driver. And it always happens with staff. <laughs> never, never happens when we have tourists to see. But that was one of my most amazing wildlife experiences. But for me, the coolest things are plants. Sorry. When you walk into the forest and you see these big trees with all these huge buttresses and all these interesting fruits and so on. And I do teach it. I know so much about it because I actually teach it. I teach forest botany is one of the things we do in terms of Iwakram in terms of training. So I, I find plants the coolest, the coolest. As much as I love animals, the plants are the coolest thing. So I For think me, you yeah, saw more in one afternoon than most field researchers see in a whole lifetime of work. I, I know, but I'm, it will never happen again. It will, oh, did we see a tyrant? I think we saw some, we saw deer as well that same night. And what happened around, around um, 6.30 when it started getting um, late, rain fell. So when rain falls, actually what happens, animals tend to come out of the forest. I think that really is what really, really helped us 
see because most of the sightings were between 6 30 and 8 o'clock wow that's well, amazing i would say i actually agree with you that when you're in the rainforest the plants are so shocking they're so prehistoric so they're it amazing. feels like you're walking through a different world um yeah. and it's, it's really beautiful well, and how your, people use plants as well. That's why that yes. intrigues me. How indigenous people use plants, how animals use plants. You know, the whole, you know, the whole agouti thing that got me started with plants, right? And I, I agoutis are my favorite animals. They're very smart. So I can't say they're not my favorite <laughs> after well, having studied them. <laughs> as, as we're finishing up here, I wanted to ask you what advice you have for people who are interested in starting a career in conservation or ecology, or even if you have any advice for your younger self when you were starting out in this career path? In my younger self, my younger self, um, you know, the thing is, I never thought I'd be in this career. It wasn't even a career option for me because when I went, when I started University of Guyana, the only options was biology, math, chemistry, medicine i think was available then and so on so the whole the whole forestry thing didn't exist or environmental studies my, my younger self though and i always say that and this this is not really related to to the forest is that you should learn a second language which was one of my failings i do speak a little bit not speak i know a little bit of spanish from studying it but i want to do it flu um, i want to learn it I wish I knew it fluently. It would have been enabled me to travel around Latin America easily or more easily. And it's something that I still have to do because when you get older, it, 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 you just don't learn it as easily. So to help you in your conservation career, I will advise persons to learn a second language, especially Spanish, I think. Spanish or Portuguese, but Spanish for me would have been been that thing I would have liked to advise myself when I was younger that I paid more attention to. But what I would like to tell young people that a career in conservation can offer you many opportunities. I've traveled many parts of Guyana and many parts of the world because of this career I've chosen for free. Not free for the work, but <laughs> free. I didn't have to pay for it. I was just going as work. And I've seen some of the most beautiful parts of the world. So I've been to Australia, I've been to Philippines, I've been to Jam uh, Jamaica, um, well, not Jamaica, Cuba. I had to go to Jamaica to go to Cuba. So I got to go to Jamaica and Cuba. My sister lives there too. So um, some, you know, some of the amazing islands, um, uh, some parts of, uh, you know, South America as well, French Guyana, Suriname. There's so many other places, Ghana, I've been to Ghana because of work. Um, I wish work had taken me to Kenya, <laughs> but you know, there are so many things that the working in conservation gives you an opportunity to liaise with some amazing people. And what I find that people in conservation actually care, they care not only for the environment, because I think what that translates to is that they, they care about people as well, generally, um, I also am very interested in human rights activism, not only environmental activism. Um, so I find uh, it's that when like a lot of my scientists, friends and so on, they actually care a lot about those aspects as well, people's welfare. I don't know if it's a, it's a, it's a Latin American, Guyanese, Caribbean thing. I, I, I hope it's also um, at least my I, Western scientist friends also. I think you know, it's global. I think when you care global. about one big issue, it's easier yes. to start caring about the other ones. Absolutely. So you care about animals, you care about dogs, you care about cats, rats, everything. <laughs> rats, and you'll be big, you'll be pleased <laughs> to know for people who've listened to multiple episodes that uh, Tim Cole's advice to young conservationists was also to learn a second language. So doubly, really? double down on that one. It's a huge, awesome. it's a huge help. Yes. Awesome. Yes, I think it does help. And I, I have to really focus on it again. You know, sometimes you get so caught up in work that you say you don't have time, but you really, we really need to make time. And I do want to advise young people, um, make time for taking care of yourself. And connecting with nature is one way to take care of yourself. Because what Absolutely. I'm finding with a lot of young people is that they're suffering from anxiety, depression. I myself suffered from depression when I started my PhD. It was really overwhelming for me. 
And when I was in England, I didn't realize that the weather would impact me. It was so dark. I am somebody that partly needs sunlight. And plus I was going through some personal challenges in my life in terms of relationship and so on. Um, and I actually sank into a very deep depression. I didn't know what it was. And really, what really saved me was coming back to Guyana and actually engaging in physical research in the forest. And that's why I keep saying the forest is my medicine. The forest really saved me. So I really want people to take care of their health, keep an eye on their health, because I find too many young people, even in the science field and in academia, are suffering from anxiety. And I keep wondering why, and I think, I think we need to really pay attention to mental health. Thank you for bringing um, that up. Career. Yes, yeah. I think that's a great point. And it can go the opposite way as well. Someone coming from a cold gray country and spending a lot of time in the rainforest in a tropical country with lots of light and colors can also be extremely can also be, yes. shocking and, and stressful. And the insects and the, yes. the sounds, it's noisy and people are loud, we're loud and, and, and so on. So adapting to new cultures is, I have to adapt, I had to adapt to the British culture because some things that we, we see as normal, people think is loud and aggressive. You know, just how you speak and, and so on and asking for things and, and so yes. on. You know, people see it, oh, she's pushy, she's, she's this and this wasn't the case, you know? So <laughs> I think this was a great, but I must say it was my greatest learning experience because well, I actually help people now. Yes, um, well, I, appreciate, is, is, I appreciate you sharing that so vulnerably on here. It took me 17 years before I could have spoken about that whole episode and I now speak about it publicly. So wow, it's not that's shame. fantastic. Yeah. One in and four I'm, people. <laughs> I'm glad people will hear about that because I think a lot of people in academia and a lot of people in science will have gone through it. Well, I want to be conscious of your time. So I want to round us out with our last question, which I ask everybody, which is why do you personally believe that we should keep fighting to protect biodiversity and prevent climate change? And really what gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, the thing is, I love my job, so I, I, I'm very happy to, to, to get out of bed in the morning um, to come to work, but my job is not my only part of my life, so I'm answering that part first. Um, I love fashion, I love art, I love, there are a lot of things, I love music, I love live music, there's so many different things that I love. So being a scientist don't mean uh, that you have to look a certain way and, and like a certain thing, because I think there's a stereotype of what a scientist should be. We should be looking geeky, wearing glasses, looking very ordinary. So I, I dress up at times. I attend fashion shows. I try to support a lot of local art. I try to support local content, low, buying local, you know, supporting local businesses is very important to me. So those kind of things really excite me. Like this evening, I'm gonna go to a Black History, it's Black History Month in the US. So Guyana, we have a Af large Afro, um, uh, um, Afro uh, group here, of course. So we are, they're having an event. So my husband, who is indigenous Guyanese, actually, I am mixed Guyanese. So uh, my heritage is Afro, Indo, Portuguese, indigenous. So everything interests me. So we're going to, to learn about some eminent people today, you know, so that so those kinds of things, though, you know, racial justice, all of those kinds of things interest me. So. Um, I do get excited about a lot of things, quite frankly. So that I was gonna me say, for all and I'm a mother. Listeners. I'm a mother. I oh, have to get out of bed. <laughs> I'm a 14 yes. year old teenager, so I have to get out of bed. Now, in terms of conservation, we all need to be part of this, and we all have to be conscious how we use things around us, and we also need to feel that we can contribute because what I find. Often when people see all the negativity, they feel they, they feel paralyzed that they can't help. And in 2020, 2017, I attended a conference, Smithsonian kindly sponsored myself and the then Minister of Indigenous People Affairs. And we did presentations. Smithsonian in Washington had this conference called Earth Optimism. And why they started it, it was started from a concept of ocean optimism. But there are many, 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 many good stories in conservation, but we're not hearing about them. We just get that, oh, climate is changing, doom and gloom and so on. And the thing is that we have to change that rhetoric. 
that there is a silver lining and there are people changing the world, doing amazing things. And I think we need to be conscious that we, it just takes one person. It just takes one person to do that. So never feel paralyzed that you can't do anything. And even if you have to simply just work with kids to help them understand conservation, if you can travel to support organizations or entities or communities, indigenous communities that are doing tourism, for example, all around the world, travel and visit them and support them because your money will go a long way. Support projects with more. And so look, and look within your community to see how you can help and make a change, no matter where you are, whether you're in what is considered first world country or a country like mine, I'm not gonna call it third world because we in third world, we have, we have a first, first class, first world forest. So we have that to share with the world and savannah and amazing rivers and fresh water and systems. Um, so I encourage you also to come to Guyana and visit Ewokrama and Sarama and Rewa and Yupakari and Karanambu and, and all the, you know, the, the Pomeroon, Warapoka, all of these places await, await you. And we heard, we certainly hope you'd visit the Okrama as well. Of course. <laughs> well, that's a fantastic way for us to end out. I was actually going to say when you were talking about fashion and that scientists don't have to look a certain way, both of us are here, well dressed up, earrings on with me you know ready yes. for, for a meeting both scientists here so i know no one can see that because yeah, it's a we, podcast we have to break that want, stereotype that's a great point absolutely yeah we have to yeah. break that stereotype myself and one of my my um colleagues here at work we're planning to do a series of videos trying to break stereotypes about what a scientist should look like because young people see certain images and they feel especially people of color they feel that they can't, they mustn't get into these types of careers because only a certain type of person. And we have to break that image because we all are scientists at the end of the day. Um, we all can contribute to conservation. You know, just, just by doing simple schoolyard ecology, we can, you know, we all do observations. So science should not be this abstract thing that we do with it, that only a certain group of people can talk about. We all can do it, you know, citizen science. Yep, even with <laughs> earrings on. <laughs> yes, with earrings on and high heels. I have high heels on too. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the, your time, Raquel. This is fantastic. It was great to talk to you, learn more about what you're doing at Iwakrama. I think it's incredibly inspiring. And I look forward to seeing how the project continues to evolve over the yeah, next few I, years. And we would love to have you. So let me know when you're coming so we could connect. And I'd love to take you to Iwakrama. Thank you for tuning in to Opwell's Field Notes. We hope you were inspired by Raquel and the innovative management model at Iwakrama that protects both people and forests. A special thanks to our podcast producer, Mike Judson, and editor, Beth Newark, who made this and every episode possible. Please do be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes about conservation and biodiversity hotspots around the world coming soon on Opwell's Field Notes.